When we killed off Gabrielle, she didn't get killed off. She got lost down the mine shaft. <laughs> <laughs> um, we kind of knew how to. Um, we knew that we were going to play good and bad Gabrielle being confused coming back in an episode, which turned out to be family affair. Um, we knew that we wanted to introduce a new villainess, which we did in the Sin Trades. We knew that we wanted to set up a uh, flash forward premonition. Um, so we, yeah, we, we, we were pretty sus coming into season four as to where we were going and what we wanted to do. And we knew we wanted to introduce um, shaman mythology and that whole um, horsey, killing the horse to go to the other side, that all kind of crazy stuff that later kind of came back in through Amazons and fifth season lifeblood and kindred spirits and... Another type of religion, really, wasn't yeah. it? Rob's very interested in, in, in the impact of religion on society and, and, and how one becomes the dominant force in some part of the world and, and how it morphs around the planet. So Rob would kind of follow these religions and, and, and um, bring them to play in our, in our series. Gabrielle. I'm entering a world of darkness I promised myself I'd never return to. But it's the only way I can see you again. I remember the abuse we took on killing her and then bringing her back with them. They, someone, some people claim that the explanation wasn't wonderfully credible. But uh, uh, I bought it. So, so did I. Yeah. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> So evil Xena in the Sin Trade, we get to see her at her most venal, most avaricious, most lustful. She was all the um, all the seven deadly sins. She's all that personified. Mm. Um, so I always enjoyed playing her a lot. Oh, It was wonderful to have a reunion with T.J. Scott, who had directed episodes um, in season one and two, but I think he'd been away for a while. He'd had other projects on, and um, so we hadn't seen him for a while, and it was great to have T.J. down again. Um, he had a wonderful visual sense, um, and he always challenged you to do um, exciting things. Shot a huge amount of film, which was um, a nightmare for the editors um, often, but they had a lot of stuff to choose from. and. Um, yeah, we went away on location, which was something that we rarely did on Xena. Um, I'd say 95% of the episodes were shot within 25 k's of downtown Auckland. So to actually go into the central plateau area of the North Island of New Zealand um, in the middle of the mountains in early winter was um, a huge challenge, but also um, um, fantastic um, visual opportunities there. Um, it was one of the, it was early winter, um, snow wasn't completely falling around the area that we were shooting in. Uh, it was a high alpine desert, which um, it's the closest thing we have in New Zealand to a desert. Um, but you'd think that that means it gets not much rain. Well, that's not entirely true. It's, um, it's a desert because of the altitude and the type of vegetation, which gave us a very stark, barren landscape with um, lots of rocks and kind of a, a Mongolian steppe kind of look to it, which worked really well for the episode. But the first day we turned up to shoot, it was pouring with rain, and I can quite honestly say it was probably the wettest day in my career that I've ever spent shooting. Um, I remember comparing the wet weather gear that the whole crew was wearing. Some people had six or seven hundred dollar Gore-Tex um, jackets and leggings, and some people had a hundred dollar bright yellow PVC leggings. And I was interested to see after a day of continuous rain who. Um, who came out driest? Well, the quick answer is no one. After 12 hours of continuous rain, nothing worked. The, um, the guys in the PVC sweated inside and got as wet as, as everyone else. And the um, $600 Gore-Tex jackets, just after about 10 hours, just gave up and um, everyone was equally cold and wet at the end of the day. Um, there's a sequence in Sin Trade where Lucy's um, stalking um, a deer, an animal, um, and you can actually see the rain on camera um, bucketing down. It's normally pretty difficult to see rain on camera unless it's got strong backlight and it's at night. But um, when I was re-watching the episodes I went, yep, it was really raining, that is wet. 
and Steadicam was all wrapped up in plastic bags trying to um, do its job without getting rain on the lens. Anakin! What's the matter? Stay away from me. Why? You poisoned my soul. I want nothing to do with you. They would, they would be you know, terrible uh, weather conditions down there, and, and they, they, you know, I'd be talking to Eric, he'd say, it's raining, and we're in mud and all this stuff. And I said, you know, Eric, what are you complaining about? It's raining here, too. And I just wrote an incredible adventure scene. That's right. <laughs> it's just words. <laughs> yeah, you said it's just words. Right. But, you know, the great pleasure of working with Eric is that you could actually write those things, and they, they show up on TV looking wonderful, and, and I give him all the credit for making those things work. Well, I just farmed it out to other people. I couldn't <laughs> tell you. <that. laughs> My mind has lost its center. It's turning. Turning. Can't hold. It can't hold. Uh, that was an interesting shot. Uh, it was a time when we um, were allowed to spend money on a nice toy. So we had a, um, a big crane with a remote head on it, and um, we used it three or four times, which reoccurs throughout the show. Um, but when Lucy is going into a trance state in the cave, uh, there's a shot where the camera spirals um, as it goes down this narrow, narrow tunnel and towards her. But it was kind of tricky because it was a very narrow um, set that we had that the art department had built. Um, it wasn't for real, it was all done in the studio. And the camera only just had enough room to, to spiral on its end as it pushed in towards Lucy. And I think they used it once as we went in towards her and then used it again as it came back out and, um, and sucked out of the cave. So that was kind of fun to do. Those little technical challenges are, um, are nice things to do to get away from the ordinary shots that you uh, are often forced into doing because of the time constraints. The, the whole experience of, of Xena was, uh, what made it so exciting was, yeah, as a writer, you, you write these wacky scripts and you send them down there and they're done wonderfully, they're produced fantastically and they're acted great and had a fair amount of good directors too, so we did okay. I was saying before that the, probably the, the greatest thing about Xena was that from the top down and every level was, it was like a big family, we all knew that we would deliver on the goods and that you know we had great actors and great directors it was it was like a family it was like going to it was never really work it was always an intense joy to come to work every day so even yeah. though we called it work <laughs> yeah well it showed, it showed on, yeah. on, 